If you would turn over to the uh, third chapter of Hebrews, we'll continue there. <clears throat> Before we do, though, let's, let's have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we ask that Thou bless the study of Thy Word for the knowledge that His ours to benefit from. We're thankful that Thou hast considered our state in this world and provided us a means to navigate it that we may attain the world to come. Bless us as we study. Bless us in all things that are right and forgive us of those things of which we are, have done amiss, of which we repent. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we left off at uh, verse uh, 4, but since it's just three verses, four verses here, three verses, we'll just go back over those real quickly. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brother, now, now he's talking to the, uh, or addressing this, and I'm going to say Paul is, even though we don't know the, really know the human hand that, uh, Put these words to paper or papyrus, whatever they used. But uh, he's calling them. These are the the uh, brethren that were in uh, contemplating going back into the mosaical system. So you couldn't call them holy from that perspective, if you want to use being righteous as holy. But they're holy because they were partakers of the heavenly calling. They were called by the gospel. They had obeyed the gospel. And they baptized and added to the church. So in that sense, they're holy brethren. And he says, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, or the uh, King James uses a profession, and I say you, we ought to be professing our confession or confessing our profession, one or the other, uh, quite often. And, of course, this is the second time that he used the uh, 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 high priest nomenclature. And I just uh, wonder if he's going to go into it much deeper, uh, starting in verse 5 and, and really into it in verse, I meant uh, chapter 5 and really into it in chapter 7. And, uh, but that may have been somewhat of a bitter pill for them to swallow because they knew Christ was not from the uh, uh, priestly tribe of, of uh, Levi. And he's going to be a high priest. He had to be from the family of uh, Aaron. And they knew he wasn't that. So... It may have uh, piqued their interest, you know, what, why is he calling him high priest? But, uh, of course, apostle is just a uh, someone who's an ambassador for someone else who's a messenger. You, know, you could call Moses, or you could describe him as an apostle. He was never called that. But he was a messenger of God to, well, the people of Israel and also to Pharaoh. So he was a messenger also. So... In, in that sense, he was uh, also uh, could be described as as an apostle. In verse uh, two, who was faithful? And it's talking about Christ, who was faithful to him, who appointed him. Now, uh, Christ came as a man. God man, but as a man, he was appointed to this uh, task. You don't have some uh, fan some feathers on it, do you? Fortunately, not. Might need some groups. Yeah. Yeah. Go back there and get some ice, if you would. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so uh, Jesus, the Christ, was faithful to God, who had appointed him, as uh, Moses was also faithful in all his house. Now, when it says Moses was faithful in his house, you may get the, the uh, impression that it was Moses' house 
It wasn't. Moses was just a servant in the house of you, you know, the house of Israel. He was a servant in that house. But he was faithful in, a, in that house. Yes, he had uh, some failures, but he was uh, uh, faithful to his calling of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. In verse 3, he said, uh, For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. And this last part of the uh, verse is just a truism. We all recognize that. That, you know, if you build a house, you have more honor than the house itself because the house owes its existence to you. And this one, in the uh, King James Version, it says man. and the uh, ASV, it says he. And I would say that that refers to Jesus. He was a man, and he was a he. <laughs> but he was counted as having more glory than Moses. Because, you know, Jesus... Uh, was responsible for the uh, creation of everything, the building of everything. So the house was, he was responsible for that too, involved in that too. So he's the builder of the house. Now what is this uh, new house? The, uh, the house of Moses is, of course, the nation of uh, Israel. It's a, it's a uh, temporal house. It's not an eternal house. But this uh, house that Jesus built is eternal, a spiritual house. In verse 4 it says, For every house is built by someone. Well, we know that. If, if there's a, every house that you see, or every building that you see is built by, by someone. It didn't just happen. Somebody had to build it. But it says, He who built all things is God. In the beginning, you remember, in the beginning. <clears throat> and it says in verse 5, And indeed, Moses was, was faithful in all his house, uh, God's house. He was faithful in uh, God's house as a servant. You remember that uh, God said that uh, you know, he spoke to Moses face to face for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. And that's uh, Moses' testimony. But what are those things which are spoken afterwards? You, you go to John, the fifth chapter, verses 45 through 47, and it refers to Moses having spoken these things about uh, uh, the coming of Christ. So that's the testimony that would be spoken afterwards, after the time of Moses. <clears throat> but Moses, Moses, uh, not no, Moses, <laughs> but in Hebrews uh, six, uh, three six. But uh, Christ has a son. You can insert in there as a faithful son over his uh, own house, whose house we are. That is the church if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope uh, firm to the end. There's some interesting, I'll probably point this out uh, later on also, but uh, it says here, if, conditional, if we hold fast the confidence. Now, keep in mind, this is being addressed to Christians uh, Hebrew Christians, they were baptized. They accept uh, Jesus as their Savior and so forth. But he's saying here, there's something else that you have to do if you want to attain uh, heaven. you got to hold fast. 
you know, sometimes we may uh, not emphasize that enough that we uh, must endure to the end. If you look at Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 22, it says there in that part of it, it said, He who endures to the end will be saved. Well, if you don't endure to the end, Hebrew Christians, if you don't endure to the end, will you be saved? And the answer is no, you will not. So uh, we, they and we need to hold fast the confidence. If we didn't have confidence in uh, the uh, Lord Jesus Christ, why were we baptized? We had to have confidence in order to, to take that step. And it is a, a matter of rejoicing. We should be rejoicing of the hope. You know, David talked about hope. Firm, you, know, you, you grab a hold of it and you don't let go of it. Firm to the end. In the verse 7 it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you will hear his voice. Now, anytime you see in, in a, a statement uh, the word today, that means you better get with it. It's urgent. Don't delay. Whatever it is that the statement says, do it and do it as soon as you can. Today, if you will hear his voice, and in verse, uh, and of course that comes from the uh, 95th Psalm, which says there in verse 7, today, again, today, if you will hear his voice, and do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And we'll talk about the rebellion later. In verse 8, it says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial and the wilderness. Now, harden is, uh, you know, your, your heart achieves or attains or falls into a condition that is just not subject to entreaty any longer. It's set, you know, don't confuse me with the facts. You just not, a hardened heart is just not subject to entreaty by uh, reasoning or anything else. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of the wilderness. And you recall that, uh, if you go back into Exodus, uh, where the uh, children of Israel were traveling about and they uh, camped at Rephidim, and they started complaining. And... Uh, you know, uh, Moses had to, uh, God told him to go uh, strike, a, take the rod which you struck the river, and behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you will strike the rock, and water will come out, and the people may drink. That's part of their rebellion, but he did it, and that was uh, what he's talking about. And he called the place Massa and Meribah. And I think that uh, ASV may use those terms also. Uh, in verse 9, it says, Where your fathers tested me, they tried me, and saw my works forty years. Now, now you think about these people and uh, in comparison with the Hebrew Christians, the people of Israel, they were under severe oppression under the uh, Pharaoh of Egypt. You know, it, was, it was really tough for them. And then Moses came to deliver them, deliver them, and they saw or heard of the miracles that were performed by Moses. And he saw all that what, what that happened uh, that led him into the, the wilderness. They saw that. They had the proof that God could do what he said he was, uh, could do, or was going to do. But yet, 
in light of all the evidence that they had, they still tested him. They tried him, and every time that uh, God was put to the test, he proved faithful. And because of their unfaithfulness, of course, they had to roam in the wilderness for 40 years. And he, so he saw the, the works for 40, they saw the works for 40 years. You know, the uh, manna and, and, and so forth. They didn't go hungry. Their clothes didn't wear out. Shoes didn't wear out. And they saw all that. But yet, when it got right down to it, uh, it before the, uh, the 40 years, of course, at Kadesh Barnea, they wouldn't go in. From that uh, position, it was only a, maybe a day's journey into the land that had been promised. But yet they, because of that uh, infidelity on their part, unbelief on their part, they had to roam uh, 40 years in the wilderness. He says, Your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore I was, in verse 10, therefore I was angry with that generation. And uh, the King James, King James says grieved and ASV says displeased, but it, it has the idea of being... Uh, their actions were loathsome, uh, disgusting. I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart. And um, both King James and ASV say err. And it just means to wander. You know that uh, Paul has said uh, they were drifting away, indicate they were drifting away. And this has the idea that they are wandering or going astray. They are going astray in their hearts. And the heart, of course, is not the that organ that's in the uh, your chest that sometimes they open up and do little procedures on it. You know that kind of that kind of heart. That's not the kind of heart it's talking about. It's talking about you can think of it as their uh, yeah, the sentiments in this case their their sentiments and they have not known my ways I thought they were uh, Jews um, these Israelites that were going to the promised land how is it that they did not know the ways of the Lord if they had known the ways of the Lord, they were trusted in the ways of the Lord. They did not trust Him, so it could be said they didn't know His ways. So in verse uh, 11, He says, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. And we're going to talk about this rest uh, a little bit later. I don't think we'll get to it now, but we'll talk about this rest later they shall not enter my rest so there's a rest that was coming a rest that was promised but they're not going to enter the, the rest and of course they were to go into the land of Canaan but they're not going to enter this rest and so Canaan is a is a type and of course today our rest is in heaven so uh, the heaven would, would be the antitype. In verse 12, it says, beware. Now, anybody tells you to beware of something, you pay close attention to it because there's danger there. Beware, brethren. Again, he calls them brethren, and at this point, they are, they are brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. See, they were considering drifting back into uh, the uh, mosaical uh, system. And any time that um, one wavers in their faith, any time someone is not sincerely 
uh, obedient to the will of Christ. <clears throat> That's occasioned by an evil heart. So drifting back, uh, being complacent, let's just say being complacent, they were, these Hebrew Christians were being complacent. Being complacent <clears throat> is evil. And we should uh, take uh, note of this, of what was said to the Hebrew Christians. Lest there be in any of you an, e an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, now note that they were doing the departing. God was faithful. He was not departing. They were departing. In verse 13, but exhort one another daily. Now, that's an interesting uh, uh, scripture. Somebody spoke about that just recently, about exhortation. Now, why is it? It says here, exhort one another daily. Now, exhort is not the same as admonishing. My admonishment may be needed, but each of us needs exhortation daily. So why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? The answer will have to come on another day. Thank you for your attention.